Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast using network models to understand common complex disease predispositions and progression presented by our keynote speaker Dr. Kenneth Buto, Director of the Computational Sciences and Informatics Program for Complex Adaptive Systems at Arizona State University and professor in the School of Life Sciences and ASU's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. We're your moderators, Jacob and Chantel. And um, we are delighted to bring you educational web seminars presented by Lab Roots. Lab Roots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to particip participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left corner of the presentation window and type your questions into the box that appears in the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button on the top right of the presentation window. Or use the Q&A button to let, them, to let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Buto. Thank you very much, Jacob and Chantel. Uh, as was indicated, I'm Ken Buteau. I'm a professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University, and I'm going to be talking today about how we are doing novel work applying network models to try to understand the underlying etiology and origins of common complex diseases, predisposition, and progression. Uh, I want to begin by my disclosures. Uh, I am an advisor to Bristol-Myers Squibb Immuno-Oncology Community Oncology Program, uh, but have no relevant disclosures or financial relationships associated with this presentation. So what does this talk about? It essentially leverages the passion of my professional research career. Uh, for almost 30 years, I've been exploring through my research team, uh, along with the rest of the scientific community, the question of what drives common disease etiology and outcomes. For example, we know large-scale epidemic emerging in the developed world for diabetes. We can see in the United States, for instance, we're anticipating uh, having 23 million cases of diabetes uh, in, the, in the upcoming, uh, currently and in the upcoming decade. But more alarming is when we look worldwide uh, at common diseases in the developing nation, we see there is a tremendous expansion of the presence and prevalence of these diseases. In China, anticipated to be 90 million cases. In India, 61 million cases. True public health crisis that we actually are still struggling with as a biomedical community, knowing to what to do with what the source of these is and how we might successfully intervene. So let's focus for a moment on obesity. Obesity is arguably a precursor condition of diabetes and many of these complex traits, but we also recognize that morbidity and mortality for something like obesity is driven not only by having this disease itself, but by the sequela that emerge after one has obesity. Uh, the development of type 2 diabetes, of liver disease, of cardiovascular disease and cancer uh, are actually the real tremendous morbid and mortal risk factors associated with having these types of diseases. What's provocative and interesting though is that when we look at obesity we see that different individuals progress down different paths. Not everyone that is obese goes on to develop any, out, out, any additional sequela. Uh, others go on to develop type 2 diabetes and what we see is very non-random patterns, very non-random paths by which many of these complex diseases evolve to increasingly greater morbidity and ultimately mortality. Shown here, for instance, on this slide is the progression from obesity to type 2 diabetes to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis to hepatocellular carcinoma. What is it that drives different individuals down different morbid paths? <laughs> 
We know a lot in 2017 about diseases like obesity. Shown on this slide is a uh, diagram from the Foresight Project in the UK where all of the etiologic components have been mapped that try to show what drives different individuals and different circumstances to have uh, obesity. At the core of this diagram is well-recognized phenomena related to physical activity, energy maintenance, energy uh, acquisition. But what we actually recognize is that this core concept is much more embedded in this much more complicated network, this morass of interacting factors that amplify this effect. We also know that these factors are distributed among a variety of different social uh, and developmental context. We see that, for instance, that there are many dynamic, evolving components that drive the origin and outcome of obesity that are not just this core central metabolic framework of energy acquisition and energy expenditure, but other complicated facets. The challenge with these, of course, is that these facets, when we look at psychology and physiology and food consumptions, are dynamic. They change over time. They change within an individual from time to time. They change uh, not only within time, but they actually change as you age. So the study of how to approach this uh, or the, com the capacity to be able to integrate all this information becomes very difficult because of the ever-changing dynamic. When do we study a person or do we actually have the practical capacity to study someone from cradle to grave? So my group has been interested in taking a different approach rather than this larger integrated framework is to start with these phenotypes and then to utilize the underlying inherited DNA variation. Our motivation for using this underlying DNA variation is it's among all of these other contributing factors to obesity, it's the one that is relatively constant from cradle to grave. Your inherited DNA variability, genomic DNA variability pattern, is your DNA pattern from the time you're born till largely till the time you die. So it's the one constant that we can look at across this entire complex continuum. Now that said, we're further encouraged that studying inherited variability may turn out to be an important contributor to these traits by recognizing that each of these traits have very high, dramatically high heritability, the fraction of total variance of the traits attributable to inherited genetic variation. We can look at traits such as obesity that have argued to have somewhere between 40 to 70 percent heritability. Uh, the, the variability of this trait due to the inherited constitution, your inherited genetic constitution. Type 2 diabetes, again, 30 to 70 percent heritability, very large fractions attributable to this genetic variation. And even cancers, one of the outcome cancers that's along the path of obesity to type 2 diabetes, to, to, through liver disease, to hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, itself has over 10 percent heritability. So there, in theory, are very strong genetic signals underpinning these traits that we should be able to find. So with great enthusiasm, my group as well as much of the genetics and genomics community have gone on large-scale genetic genome-wide association study searches to find the variability that underpins these complex, common complex diseases. Shown here is a standard Manhattan plot from a somewhat recent Nature paper showing uh, the identification of this constitutional variation associated in this instance with breast cancer, another obesity-associated cancer. But what we've seen as we've conducted more and more of these studies is disheartening. We've found that when we find these individual loci on these Manhattan plots that they have very small effects, commonly odds ratios of 1.1, of barely above significance, and with, again, large enough sample sizes, almost anything can be t detected. But the influence of any individual loci or locus is quite small. These highly associated SNPs are not observed commonly across studies. 
In fact, uh, while one can conduct very large meta-analysis and find interrelationships, if you look at study to study, very rarely it's the unusual case that you will find a SNP that's highly associated and is reproducible across studies. Moreover, what we find is that the fraction of this heritability, even when we've done these genome-wide SNP assessments, uh, with increasingly high resolution of genetic analysis, uh, that there's a very small fraction of this heritability that I just mentioned being described. So here's a concrete example for the three examples that I showed a moment ago. So in obesity, it's, it's optimistically estimated that we're explaining maybe 20% of the total heritability. Type 2 diabetes, embarrassingly even less, less than 5% of the total heritability explained by our common genome-wide studies. Uh, and when we look at cancer as well, this specific form of cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, that's associated with obesity and type 2 diabetes, we see that have actually a very small, less, le less than 20, a little over 20% of the variance is explained. So arguably, uh, by at least common contemporary standards, we might describe this as an epic fail. So why? Why, why are we failing so miserably in these studies? Well, some of this is predictable from what we actually know a lot about population genetics, evolutionary history of populations, uh, as well as the underlying biology that is not being captured in these genome-wide association studies. So we know that there's heterogeneity in etiology due to local adaptation and drift, and we also know that we're not a formally capturing in these genome-wide association studies the underlying biologic mechanisms that drive these patterns of variation. So let me start with what I mean by local adaptations to environmental challenges. We tend, when we study these types of phenomena, to assume that all humans have the identical genetic constitution and that there is little or no variation, that we can consider all humans to be essentially the same as inbred laboratory mice. Well, unfortunately, that's just simply not true. Humans, over their course of evolutionary time, have repeatedly adapted to their local environments. Perhaps the best understood example of this is studying hemoglobinopathies with the slide shown here, where we can see that across the, across the, uh, across the world, in high malarial areas, there have been repeated adaptations to extreme environments that generate heterogeneity in the underlying genetics of this particular trait. So there is not a single human variant associated with malaria or in response to malaria, but a whole, a whole collection, literally a dozen or more individual adaptations that have occurred independently over evolutionary time uh, that actually would not be easily detected in the current frame of the types of studies that are being done with GWAS. Here's another example of this, where we look at not just uh, malaria, but where in this instance we look at all sorts of adaptations to environments. But again, a recurring rule is that there is local adaptation that has occurred in, in response to common environmental activities. So in this instance highlighted here is the distribution, worldwide distribution of specific different genes associated with adaptation to high altitudes. So over the course of human evolution, during the time of human evolution, what we've seen then is that this pressure has generated multiple solutions to the same problem of high altitude. Let's go back for a second now, though, and also now look at malaria again. In this instance, uh, pressure, pressure associated with malaria, I showed the modifications in the first series of slides for this in respect to beta globin, but what we can see is there have been other adaptations over and above what has happened with beta globin and hemoglobin in response to malaria. Let's focus, for instance, on the glycophorin A and glycophorin B. Again, two adaptations that have occurred arguably or have been argued to be in response to malaria. So glycophorin A and B actually are captured commonly in serotyping in the MNS blood group. And what we can see here now is the worldwide distribution of those. So 
again, as we start to look at genetic etiology of something complex and common, like obesity or diabetes, then it's not completely surprising that we are going to see heterogeneity in the underlying patterns of particular variants. So shown here, for those of you who might not remember that genetics occurred before the advent of DNA sequencing, this is worldwide distribution of blood group typing by Morant, uh, and I'm going to refer to more of his work in just a second. But we can see radically different distributions of risk alleles or the alleles that evolved in response to malaria in different populations. Uh, with the M group being very high in the Americas and actually being very low in the, in the African subcontinent. What we also see is not only do we have these multiple independent variants in a locus or, var or lo variants occurring in different loci, but we also see that in some instances from the paper here uh, in uh, FAN, actually, uh, sorry, this isn't highlighting well, if we look to the third or fourth panel down, we can see that some of the variation is attributable to polygenic inheritance. So if we put a circle around there, what we can see is that many of these traits, in order to actually be responsive to environment, don't occur just don't require modifications in a single locus, but require modifications in multiple loci in order to produce uh, their response to the phenotype. We also know that there's heterogeneity. So this is implied when I showed in the M and S blood group across the world. But we know that there is tremendous heterogeneity even in populations that we consider to be common. So let me focus for a second here on a class that's routinely used in GWAS studies, people of European descent, or even people of Northern European descent, are considered to be a common contrast group uh, that we can assemble the groups for. So here we're going to focus again on a, a common variant that, that's, uh, that we know the DNA basis of in uh, 2017, but that uh, uh, again was described in detail by Morant in 1954, we can see that if we look at the ABO blood group here, one that almost everyone here probably knows their types that's participating in this uh, or that's monitoring this talk, uh, and we can see that the assumption that we can look at Europeans as a common community, if we just look at the A allele of the ABO blood group, isn't violently uh, violated. We can see that there's relatively high homogeneity across northern Europe. Uh, especially if we exclude the populations of high northern latitude. However, this gets a little more dicey if we actually now look at the distribution of B across Europe. We can see that, in fact, this northern European group is no longer quite as, quite as homogeneous as uh, what we saw with B. And when we actually start to move to the type O group, we see uh, that, in fact, there's tremendous heterogeneity in the gene frequency, the allele frequency associated with the O blood group. Uh, so uh, what we can see is that even this population, for a common variant that we actually know very well, has tremendous variation within a group that, within a group that we normally count on ha being homogeneous. So why is that significant? Well, the challenge is then if we don't account for that, or don't have a way in our analytic message to address this, then we artificially generate associations. And we will see differences that we're ascribing to cases and controls because we have slight differences, for instance, if we're using Europeans. Slight differences whether we have how many Germans we have in our population versus how many French we have in our population. We will get significant differences, especially with the ultra-high sample sizes that we're using in today's GWAS studies. These minor differences will all turn out to be highly significant, but not reproducible study to study because of the variation between the different populations and the different studies. So there's one other, and this is one of the key factors that we're interested in exploring, and that's that we're not measuring interaction. So we have the population history, population genetics, and population dynamics that drive or challenge us doing these types of identification studies. But we also have the challenge that we're not embracing the biology uh, associated with many of these traits. So I've, ex I've mentioned certainly that many of these traits are polygenic. But they're even more than polygenic. They actually work. Complex phenotypes are products 
of biologic networks. They are emergent properties of multiple changes that are occurring in complex biologic processes that are captured in networks, and these networks are what drive specific phenotypes. Uh, I actually love this T.S. Eliot quote that actually captures where I think we are currently in our single independent SNP evaluation. We're sort of caught in this hell of disconnected data that if we actually look at the data through the lens of interconnected networks, biologic processes, or biologic pathways, that may give us insight. Now, the cancer community, at least the somatic genetics cancer community, is, has embraced this now for almost a decade partly out of necessity. It became very clear with large-scale projects like the Cancer Genome Atlas and other class projects that the was not coherence to the data sets unless we integrated what was being observed in cancer mutations at the level of networks. And when we assembled the data in these networks, what we saw is that suddenly data that looked remarkably noisy and chaotic, very coherent, with us having the capacity to assemble all of these mutations into common pathways. So what we've been doing in our group now then is using this network framework as a primary analytic routine. Now I don't want to say that GWAS studies after they have done their individual SNP analysis don't commonly look to see if networks are overrepresented by the significant SNPs they found. What we're doing is upfront starting with collections of SNPs in networks and then analyzing the network to see whether the distribution is different of the SNPs within a network uh, than uh, one would expect by chance alone or that that distribution differs between cases and controls. So the advantage of using this network analysis is that it both integrates the regional heterogeneity in disease risk modifying loci. So in other words, if you in these adaptations that I showed in earlier slides have modified variants in different components of these biologic processes in order to accomplish your modified phenotype. This will now be captured uh, in the network analysis. It also captures the interaction information. So it's been argued that the missing heritability in genomic studies is that we're not capturing the interaction terms between the individual SNPs that amplify the effects of the individual SNPs when we look the, over and above what we would see if we looked at their marginal frequencies independently. And then practically, one of the attractive things of this is we look at then, instead of having to look at a million SNPs or two million SNPs or three million SNPs, we look at 2,500 biologic processes. So we actually increase our power and reduce the dimensionality of the investigations that we're attempting to explore. So the key methodology that I'm going to describe in the results that I'm presenting today uh, is an extension of the work initially published by uh, Rosemary Braun uh, while she was a postdoc at the National Cancer Institute called the Pathways of Distinction Analysis, a, a technique for combining multi-SNP analysis using GWAS data. Uh, in this particular work, we use a distance-based metric where we essentially calculate the distance between cases and controls uh, using the met network as the assembly proxy of this variability uh, under the assumption that individuals who have a genetically based trait, and now remember all the traits we looked at had high heritability, somewhere between 30 to 70 percent heritability. They should have network, or they should have genetic uh, underlying contributions to their variability, that those who have the trait should have a different distribution of their genetic variability than those who do not. And we use a distance metric in order to quantify that. So in this instance, for those of you who are interested in the technical details, I point you directly to Rosemary's paper. But the distance statistic was initially derived by Homer et al. for solving the uh, forensics problem. Uh, but it's actually relatively simple conceptually. We just look at each individual uh, and then measure their distance from cases to controls and summarize this across all of the loci in individual networks. 
Uh, so this is stated in words what this looks like. Perhaps a picture is easier to conceptualize. So that distance metric that you see at the top is essentially just looking for each individual in our study and measuring their distance, uh, their genetic distance, from cases and controls, and then standardizes it, uh, showing uh, in a standardized fashion so we can compare across individual pathways. And statistics is, are evaluated either with uh, the pathway of distinction score, where we look specifically at a pathway, or we use the distance metric uh, and calculate odds ratios, and use, uh, again, bootstrapping and permutation tests to adjust uh, the under, for the underlying non-normality of the data resources. So what I want to talk about in, is now what we see when we actually apply these to several complex traits, common complex traits. So we've examined data, uh, independent data sets that are publicly available through dbGaP uh, for both type 2 diabetes. We've obtained four public data sets and for obesity, where we've obtained three publicly shared data sets. We also then have access from previous work, uh, a collaborative data set from our colleagues in Korea for hepatocellular carcinoma. And what we've then done is apply these network metrics to attempt to identify uh, the underlying networks, pathways that may underpin these complex traits. So let me focus in detail on the type 2 diabetes data set. Uh, I realize this may be difficult to read other than uh, it's this sort of obligatory population genetics slide that describes the, pop the characteristics of the populations. But the key here is to indicate that these are relatively large case control study sets. In each instance, in two of the data sets, over 1,000 cases and controls. Uh, two of the other two are somewhat smaller, but still large enough to, be specific, to test specific hypotheses. And uh, what we then do is use the genotyping that was available through dbGaP in these data sets to evaluate uh, the differences in these networks. So shown here is the key result that we've obtained from this. So if we look across these, uh, these four different data sets, what we find uh, is that there are a minimum of 10 pathways when we order them by the ones that contribute have the highest uh, differentiation by their odds ratios, we find that there are 10 pathways, 10 highly significant pathways across all four data sets. And those pathways are summarized on this slide. So you can see that the distinction scores and the odds ratios, one of the things notable if we focus on the OR odds ratio column to begin with is we can see that we're seeing significantly greater odds ratios than we would see for any individual SNP. And more pragmatically, if we look at this probability of these odds ratios, we see whoppingly high significant when we're integrating at this level. So these pathways include GPCR downstream signaling, PI3 AKT signaling, pathways in cancers, MAPK signaling, focal adhesion, WINT signaling, calcium signaling, HTLV1, neurotransmitter receptor, and axon guidance. And I'm going to focus on two of these. What do, what do these actually look like in our analyses? So let's focus first on axon guidance, one that you may not immediately think of. And I would actually share with you that pathway names are probably as misleading in some sense uh, as gene names. They actually describe the original biologic context. But again, a priori, one wouldn't expect axon guidance uh, as a pathway process itself to necessarily be driving type 2 diabetes susceptibility. So let's try to look at a little more detail what's involved with axon guidance in our analysis. So axon guidance is one of the pathways that we've obtained from KEG. Uh, I realize in this form it's very hard to actually see these pathways, but part of what I want you to pick up from this is the gestalt of this pathway. So we're assaying the green boxes here indicate that we actually had SNPs in the specific genes that we could evaluate. Uh, pink SNPs indicate that when we took all of the genes in this pathway and did a step-down analysis. These was the minimum subset of genes or SNPs within these genes uh, that retain the original odds ratios significance. Uh, and then uh, the red genes I will talk to in a minute are genes that overlap, genes that actually when we look across our 10 pathways are common across pathways. So you can see already in axon guidance 
that it's a proper subset of these genes, uh, just from the gestalt of the pink that drive the significance of this network. And interestingly, there's substantial overlap in this pathway with other pathways. So let's zoom in on one of the components of this so you can see it in a little bit more detail, but also see where this modular overlap starts to occur in these networks. So this box that I just brought up here captures the components that are arguably in axon guidance, part of the WINT signaling pathway. What you can see here is then uh, it's a proper subset of these that turned out to be significant with the step-down evaluation. Uh, uh, we can see, interestingly, uh, already genes that overlap from the other pathways that I showed uh, in these red components. So we see that one of the components of axon signaling is the wind signaling pathway itself. We can also look at another piece of the axon guidance. In this instance, we look at this segment here. And what we see here is that the map K signaling pathway is also a piece, or modules from the MAPK signaling pathway are also part of the axon guidance. And again, what we can see is that it's a proper subset that are significant, and interestingly, even a smaller subset that appear to be common across this and other members of this 10 pathway set. So let's look at another pathway for a second, another one that you might not expect to be important in type 2 diabetes, HTLV1 infection. Again, this is another keg pathway. Uh, it's displayed in a similar manner to what I sh mentioned a moment ago. Let's drill into the subcomponents here of this particular pathway. What we can see here, interestingly, is we do pick up, not surprisingly, members of the WINT signaling pathway as well as the MAPK signaling pathway. But we also pick up a new module as part of this HTLV1 unit, which is T cell receptor signaling pathway. So what we can see is we're not only looking at the basic cell metabolism, cell division, cell control processes, but we're picking up genes and units, modules, biologic modules that appear to be guiding and important in modulating immunoresponses, which uh, many people have been interested in with respect to type 2 diabetes as, as thinking of it as related to an immune disease. So we'll look at another component of this particular pathway. So in this instance, we'll look at uh, this unit. And what we can see key here again is Again, we see other members of our pathway, but central to this is antigen presentation, antigen processing and presentation. Again, related in particular in almost the yang to the T cell signaling receptor yang. So we can see interesting handshakes and conceivable uh, mechanistic insights that are emerging from seeing the assembly of these individual modules. What's interesting, if we just take all of the individual genes, for our step-down analysis of these 10 pathways, there's 259 of these individual genes. What's fascinating is that these 259 genes themselves form a super network. They are not working independently of each other. So even though we describe this as 10 separate networks, what we can see is, in fact, this is one mega network. This is one complex of interacting genes that apparently are driving susceptibility to type 2 diabetes. And even more provocatively, if we then focus on those genes that were observed in one or more pathway, we get 66 of 68 of those genes forming a very tight network that appears to define a common underlying etiology across four different data sets with respect to type 2 diabetes. We can actually look at these individual 68 genes using an alternative projection of the data and see uh, what other biologic functions of these 68 genes, what are the key things that's driving uh, these kind of phenomena. And what we can see here then is that with this gene ontology analysis, not completely surprising, we see things like positive regulation of gene expression, negative regulation of signaling, uh, regulation of protein serine kinase, uh, and regulation of response to stress. We've not surprised, given when we looked at our modules, that we saw that maybe one of the underlying biologic frameworks that's driving type 2 diabetes is immune response. A little more surprising, though, then, is that we find a significant pathway is neurogenesis.
Again, we had axon guidance, and now we also have neurogenesis, which is suggesting a, a fascinating underlying etiologic pattern, and one we can speculate on later as to what might be important or why are we having uh, common etiology to type 2 diabetes. So, key notes of analyzing these 10 pathways, the analysis at an individual SNP level does not identify the canonical type 2 diabetes risk loci using conventional GWAS significant criteria. So if we look at these four data sets that were present in dbGaP, they do not identify the traditional type 2 diabetes canonical loci that these large-scale meta-analyses have found. Uh, so they're not within our analysis or in the author's original publication of these work. Uh, these canonical type 2 risk factors are, though, represented in the pathways when analyzed, uh, but not necessarily in the most significant pathways. So it's not that the canonical loci are not present in our analysis. They are not the driving loci of our common underlying network analysis features. So what we then did, as I mentioned, is look at these networks not only in type 2 diabetes, but in three independent obesity-related data sets that were, again, obtained from DB, uh, dbGaP for, uh, as publicly accessible data sets. Interestingly, if we look at these data sets, uh, in contrast to the type 2 diabetes data sets, we see substantial overlap in the network modules, in the networks that are driving BMI as, a, as well as type 2 diabetes. Now, not all of the pathways are represented in all of the obesity data sets, uh, but we, we can see that on average, uh, at least five of the 10 pathways, and if we uh, and look actually there's uh, on overall uh, that if all 10 of them in one or more of the data sets appear to be represented. What we can also see is when we look at these BMI data sets, they also have much larger odds ratios associated with uh, distinguishing cases from controls uh, than you would see for normal obesity producing individual SNPs. So these SNPs taken in network context are telling us an amplified story that distinguishes uh, those from high BMI with those with low BMI. So what we also saw, looking at our disease progression story, so if we argue that uh, obesity progresses to type 2 diabetes, dia uh, diabetes and that type 2 diabetes can put you at risk for primary liver cancer, interestingly, if we then look at our liver cancer data set, we can see that a then an interesting number of these highly significant pathways in type 2 diabetes also significantly differentiate those who are going to develop uh, or di are different between those with liver cancer and those without liver cancer. So again, back to our original table that has the type 2 diabetes results. Uh, this single column for type 2 diabetes is when we just looked at the data, combined all four data sets and estimated across using a common set of estimates across all the data sets. But what we can see is seven of these 10 pathways also show high odds ratios, significantly high odds ratio. All of these are, are when uh, uh, multiple comparisons adjusted are, are highly significant, but show uh, seven of these 10 pathways also appear to be risk modulating, not only in obesity, not only in type 2 diabetes, but also in HCC. So when we actually then look at the small subset of genes that were, uh, that were common across the pathways uh, in liver cancer, the seven pathways, we can see that those genes themselves produce a network just the same as what we saw in type 2 diabetes. So again, the genetic underlying genetic predisposition to liver cancer doesn't appear to be uh, random collections of genes throughout the genome, but in fact is assembled collection of genes in a mega network that appears to be producing a phenotype. But interestingly, then, we can look at this small network and contrast it to the network we saw with type 2 diabetes. And what we can see then is these networks overlap. They have touch points. They have key pivot points 
uh, that would interconnect your susceptibility to diabetes and susceptibility to liver cancer, uh, but don't completely overlap. So it would help us, number one, understand at one level why some people progress for disease and other people don't, and then may suggest to us who is on which different progression paths, depending which portfolio of these risk alleles you might have. So you may have risk alleles that would put you at risk for type 2 diabetes following obesity, and risk alleles that would put you at risk for HCC following type 2 diabetes, but don't necessarily have all of them all the time. You would have to have these unique combinations in order to make that full progression uh, from uh, obesity uh, to morbidity and mortality in liver cancer. So our observations here is that we believe network analysis finds common biologic processes within complex traits that network analysis identifies these processes along the disease progression path. The genes common across process are classified as controlling regulation of processes and the biologic processes identified are both expected related to energy production uh, and energy metabolism, both critical to, well, critical to obesity, critical to type 2 diabetes, and of course critical to an oncology cancer phenotype. But we also get some surprising uh, pathway, pathway units like axon guidance or our GO ontology with respect to neurodevelopment. So what this may suggest is that these complex networks are underlying risk pathways for these common modern maladies, uh, but may be products of evolutionary adaptation to other traits uh, that may represent either uh, mismatch to common environment or trade-offs uh, to the adapted environment that drove these networks and our current common environment. So I want to thank and acknowledge the uh, team that's actually made all this work possible, both my colleagues at ASU, uh, my previous colleagues at the National Cancer Institute, uh, the, uh, my colleagues that have shared with us the uh, Korean data sets, uh, as well as uh, thank the uh, contributors uh, to the DB uh, GAP data sets uh, that permit this type of next generation data science analysis. So, with that, I want to close and say that we are always interested in collaborators, partners. If people are interested in participating in these kinds of studies, have interesting data sets, would be interested in learning how we do these methodologies and apply them to these complex data sets, we'd be uh, very interested in hearing from you, interacting with you, uh, and exploring uh, how we might apply this exciting new approach uh, to understanding these complex uh, traits uh, and their progression. So. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vito, for that informative presentation. We'll now start the live question and answer portion of the webinar. Let's get started. Our first question is, what are the limitations of using this network approach? So that's, thank you, thank you, audience, for that interesting question. Network analysis, as you might pick up from my presentation, uh, has many strengths and we're very enthusiastic about its ability to extend what has been done with classical GWAS or genome-wide association studies. Uh, it has limitations in a number of frames. One is that not all, even today, not all the protein coding genes are represented uh, in biologic networks or biologic pathways, so we don't always have the capacity to fully interrogate uh, the entire uh, genomic or genome suscept genomic susceptibility space. Even more so, over and above the protein coding genes, many of the biologic networks as they exist today don't capture the emerging fields of microRNAs or long non-coding RNAs or other regulatory features uh, that could be driving, uh, driving these uh, types of associations. So we're working on a next generation uh, in our lab of exploring how we will bring together that additional information into a network context. Uh, and stay tuned, that will perhaps be our next, uh, our, our next webinar uh, uh, for, uh, for Lab Roots. Next question. For the next question, do you have ideas regarding why pathways would be common across these data sets? I, I think that's an interesting question. So we don't really know the underlying, you know, why 
certain biologic processes might be more important than other biologic processes, but uh, not surprisingly, given from the center, that I'm from the Center for Evolution and Medicine, we think there could be provocative reasons that have to do with that very early portion of the talk that I mentioned where we talk about local adaptation associated with the development of genet under changes in one's gen genetic architecture. So we, what's fascinating to me is that these phenotypes that we're looking at, obesity, diabetes, are actually worldwide common and actually may represent adaptations that occurred very early in the human lineage. Uh, and there's been speculation that Part of this could be attributable from uh, other authors, uh, Greg Gray and others, uh, that, that this may be attributable to the you know, human evolutionary adaptation required for us to have big brains, both the energy requirements uh, as well as the lipid requirements, and that modifications that facilitated our evolutionary adaptation to be the modern humans we are may have been, occurred with the trade-off of later, later age or later life uh, compromises to our fitness that had no impact on our reproductive outcomes. Uh, we have another one here, which is, how do these findings move the field forward? Well, I think there's uh, several applications that could come from these. So one of them is that they give us novel insights into the biologic processes. So, so it's an ab initio discovery process. So in this instance, rather than actually having to uh, look where the light is, by doing these network processes and by de novo discovering them, we actually have now clues of the underlying biologic etiology that may not have occurred uh, from just standard uh, laboratory investigation or studying the metabolic process or other things that we can directly observe but may not actually be critical to the, to the origins of the disease. It also gives us a foundation. So as I started with the talk earlier, I said that there's no shortage of complexity associated with the origins of phenotypes such as obesity and diabetes. But it also now gives us maybe some uh, what could become ground truth that we can now bring into our studies to evaluate who develop diseases uh, with a common under where we can see why some people who had genetic susceptibility didn't develop disease or why some people who had susceptibility did develop disease given their differences in exposures. Okay, last question. How might these findings be applied? Well, it's still early days and as like any a biologic investigation or scientific investigation, what we're seeing here needs to be validated with additional data sets and needs to be confirmed with larger studies. But what we think is interesting, uh, a near, uh, an immediate near-term application of these is to do some flavor of risk stratification, to be able to evaluate who, when they have obese phenotype, is likely to progress on to type 2 diabetes so that they can be differentially uh, focused, attentions and resources can be differentially focused on those. Or similarly uh, for uh, those with type 2 diabetes, we could explore and identify who's at greatest risk of developing liver cancer or who's at greatest risk of moving on to a liver cancer phenotype and then do targeted screening and other uh, interventions for those particular components. Okay, well thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn the floor back over to the moderators. Thank you. We'd like to once again thank Dr. Buto for his presentation, and I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August of 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's webinar. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.